everybody. Welcome to the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. I'm your host, Ben Pokolsky, always framing this podcast around doing everything we possibly can to live a long, healthy, vibrant life with jacked bodies. <laughs> now, we all want to be happy. We all want to be healthy. We want to feel great, look great. And sometimes there's these negative, insidious things happening inside our body that we're just not aware of. And today's guest is going to talk all about heart health. Dr. Stephen Hussey joins us to discuss everything there is to know about heart health. That's a really good explanation. He actually does a very good job of being very clear and concise on some of the action items, some of the mistakes, misnomers, and common things that we need to do to optimize heart health from arteriosclerosis, arthrosclerosis, demystifying cholesterol a little bit, and his approach to optimizing heart health. Now, I think he does a really good job, to be honest, in kind of debunking some of the common health myths. But that being said, I think this is definitely one of those podcasts where you need to take this information and do some research. Dr. Hussey is a very, very bright man, a functional medicine doc, and he knows a lot, but I still think there's always two sides to every coin, every argument. So, you know, I strongly suggest you listen right through the end. We have some really, really interesting exchanges, and uh, he's got some really awesome perspective and some data on why his approach may be the most effective one. I think you're going to love this. We talk a little bit about why your teeth are implicated in health, how toxins may be the number one cause of heart disease and why cholesterol may not be doing what you think it is, and as well as saturated fats. Today's podcast is brought to you by Blue Blocks. You guys know that I started wearing Blue Blocks of my own accord uh, probably about a year and a half ago now, and I picked some up for myself and my family. Uh, My kids wear them all the time, and uh, we've since decided to create a partnership with Blue Blocks because they're that good. They look awesome, and they actually work really, really well. If you want to see what they look like, head over to blueblocks.com slash muscle intelligence, and they've got some really cool styles. You can get 15% off your first order and actually even ongoing, and I suggest if you're going to get them, you get a, a clear pair if you spend any time at the computer or on your phone and you get a red pair for before bed. Yellow pair I typically will wear in kind of the dusk hours of the day if I'm doing any driving or anything like that where I know I'm going to get a little bit too much blue. Or if I'm at a conference or something like that, sometimes I'll throw on a yellow pair because this, the massive amount of blue can be really, really stressful to your system. But beyond that, I usually just go with the clear ones during the day if I'm sitting at my computer because blue light can actually be potentially negative to the uh, function and quality of your eyesight. And then red is what you need to be wearing at night if you're ever getting any blue exposure or driving or anything like that, where you're going to get a high amount of lumen sent into your retina, which is going to give your brain the stimulation that says, hey, it's time to wake up now rather than go to sleep. So that would be a great place for you guys to start. Again, blueblocks.com, B-L-U, no E, B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com slash muscle intelligence. And you can use the code MUSCLE for 15% off your purchase. And they'll do free shipping worldwide because they're based in Australia, but now they have distribution in the U.S. as well. So I hope you guys have an amazing day and enjoy this podcast with Dr. Stephen Hussey. I'm joined here today with Dr. Stephen Hussey. Doc, how are you today? Pretty good. How are you? I'm doing well. And heart health is a huge area of interest for me. So for you know, a little bit of my history, for 20 years, I was an aspiring professional bodybuilder, you know, accumulating as much muscle and eating a, a tremendous amount of food. So uh, at some point, we all become aware of our own mortality. And, and this heart health thing is one of those silent killers, right? And it's like, I have friends, colleagues, uh, and peers who are literally passed away now from things that they just wouldn't expect. And it's the silent killer. And this is why I'm so excited to have you come on here and talk about ways we can optimize our life and you know, hopefully keep heart health optimized and give us some of the biggest things we can do to move the needle and obviously addressing some of the myths as well. So just kicking right off, I mean, I think it'd be awesome for us to just talk about the science or what is actually happening with respect to heart disease. So when someone has heart disease and you know, going down this path of heart attack or heart disease in general, what is that? What is actually happening? Yeah, I think... So the way I see it is that there's kind of three categories of what people would call heart disease. One, I think, is this process of atherosclerosis, which is, you know, the hardening of the arteries wherever they they may be. But I think it's interesting to ask the question of, you know, because it's thought or I guess that it's, it's widely promoted that high cholesterol in your blood is this atherosclerotic forming or, or I guess triggering thing. But the question we need to ask is, if 
this high cholesterol or high LDL in the blood is what's driving atherosclerosis and cholesterol is distributed evenly throughout the blood, why do we only see atherosclerosis in arteries and not veins? And why do we not see it everywhere in arteries? Why do we only see it in some places in people? So there's that part of heart disease. There's also heart attacks. So we get tissue death in the heart muscle for whatever reason. And I have my, my theories about why that is. And then the third, I guess, category of heart disease is heart failure. And this is kind of looked at as the heart is not doing its job of pumping the blood, which I would argue that the heart is not necessarily a, a full-blown pressure propulsion pump. It's more like a hydraulic ram. But yeah, those are the kind of the three categories of heart disease. And we have this big collective term that kind of any, I guess, malfunction of the cardiovascular system. So yeah. Very interesting. So you said you kind of had theories about why these things exist in the heart and not in, or sorry, in the arteries and not in the veins. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the blood is almost half water. And so there's this really unique phenomenon that happens with water. And this is the work of Dr. Gerald Pollack up at University of Washington. He's studied water for a very long time. Yep. He's been on the show. Yeah. Great. So yeah, hopefully listeners are familiar with this then. So the water that forms is called, you know, fourth phase water or structured water or exclusion zone water. And it forms in arteries. It forms anywhere that the water has sufficient energy to it. So that would be energy from our external environment. Even humans give off radiant energy ourselves. And then also a hydrophilic surface, a water loving surface. And that's exactly what the lining of an artery is. And so when we have that kind of recipe, we get this formation of structured water on the lining of an artery all the way around the inner circumference of the artery. And there's two very important, I guess, reasons why that happens. One is that it actually creates blood flow because of the energy gradient that forms between the structured water and the hydrogen ions that are left outside of that. But then as far as atherosclerosis goes, this fourth phase water is also called exclusion zone water. And it's called that because it excludes everything that isn't it. So when Dr. Pollock got this stuff to form in a lab, there was no molecule that would ever penetrate this exclusion zone. It was all excluded over to the side. He tried all kinds of things and he tried, you know, just dirt molecules. He tried the smallest molecule he could find, which is the protein albumin, which is super small and it was excluded. And the only thing that he's found that can get through are some very tiny like ionic minerals, I think like potassium. But the importance of that is that it's protecting the lining of the artery. And so we talk about this glycocalyx that forms on the lining of the artery, and then we have the endothelia and then the subendothelial space. But the first line of defense, I think, is this exclusion zone water. And so I think that then we have to ask ourselves, or I think the key to artery health is maintaining this exclusion zone water on the lining of our arteries. So then we have to ask ourselves, what would A, create you know, healthy exclusion zone water there, but then also what would break it down? what things in our environment could cause damage to it. And so it's interesting because, like I said, the protein albumin is excluded. And that protein is way smaller than any LDL, HDL, VLDL, lipoprotein little a, anything that we think causes or could potentially contribute to atherosclerosis. It excludes all that because it excludes the protein albumin. So there's no way that's getting through if we have this intact barrier. So this barrier forms when our body has energy to it. And so the ways that our body absorbs energy to energize the water so that it can form this lining of exclusion zone water in the artery is radiant energy. So like from the sun or what's popular these days is people use infrared saunas or the red light therapies, things like that. There actually is something to this. We're actually forming the structured water in our bodies. Also grounding. Has that been shown? The infrared, like the artificial infrared is actually going to help with structured water as well? Yes. Well, not like from a study of a, like say in a sauna where someone sits in a sauna and they measure fourth phase water. I don't know if there's any way to measure fourth phase water in a human, but in Pollock's lab, definitely. Okay. They expose water to infrared light and more structured water is formed. Interesting. Definitely. Yeah. And I think that that explains the studies that we see with infrared sauna use where people get in them and they do like a, you know, a regimen of however many weeks for how many days for however many weeks. And, you know, their blood flow increases a huge amount. And like I said, the formation of that also drives blood flow. So it explains that. So is it the idea then, Stephen, that this exclusion zone water will kind of envelop the, the lining of the arteries and prevent anything from attaching to those arteries until you don't have enough of this exclusion zone water? Now the plaques can actually start to kind of accumulate on the, the artery walls. Is that what the, it's, we're getting at? Yeah, definitely. And so like I was starting to say is, and I got off track, but I was starting to say that we have to ask ourselves what could break down this exclusion zone water. 
And so when we look at how the water forms, a water molecule, you know, is a oxygen and two hydrogens. And when this situation takes place where the water forms, it actually cleaves off one of the hydrogens and you're left with an oxygen and a hydrogen. And that goes and forms with other oxygens and hydrogens into this lattice-like structure that lines itself up nicely against the hydrophilic surface and becomes the exclusion zone water. And then we're left with a bunch of other hydrogens out in the middle of the, the artery. But because it does that, the oxygen molecule is negative and then the hydrogen is positive. And since we lost one of the hydrogens, the oxygen molecule is bigger. And so the fourth phase of water is a net negative charge. And when it's a negative charge like that, it has a lot of electrons to donate. And so if we think about this idea of free radicals, oxidative stress, where they're running around, free radicals are running around looking for an electron to be paired with just so that they're stable. And so if we have a lot of oxidative stress or free radicals in our bloodstream from various different things, from toxins, from, you know, the endogenous process of burning energy, specifically yeah, carbohydrates. Exercise, right? Yeah, exercise could do this. If we have too many of these, they can break down this exclusion zone water. But there's many other things too. I think that, I mean, there's studies that show that the amount of mercury uh, that they tested in someone's hair analysis was directly relevant to how much atherosclerosis they have. And mercury, heavy metals in general are known free radicals. Also, endotoxemia. So, you know, you can get endotoxemia from having a leaky gut and bacteria leaking into your bloodstream that shouldn't be there or from root canals or pulled teeth that weren't cleaned out very well. That bacteria can leak in and those have been shown to act like free radicals as well. Right. But exercise, isn't that one of the primary ways to create more exclusion zone water? I guess if your body was giving off more radiant energy when you're exercising, then yes, because- yeah, creating more negative charge, right? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they've shown in Pollock's lab, like when they're doing these experiments that you can just hover your hands around where they're measuring the water and more exclusion zone water forms. So, we definitely give off radiant energy. And, and I don't know for sure, but it makes sense to me that yes, increasing your body temperature and metabolism and all that through exercise would definitely do that. So, someone who's maybe less active or less healthy, would they give off less radiant energy? Yes, because I think that their metabolism is just going to be slower, not optimal. Can you define radiant energy for me? I just want to understand what that means. Is it just like the natural frequencies my body emits because I'm a human being or is it something more complex than that? So, it's the way I see it, like infrared light is the best form of radiant energy that Pollock found in his lab that would create the fourth phase water. There's many other things that would do it, like the contact with the earth and all that stuff, but infrared light. So, when I say radiant energy, I'm talking about infrared and that's light that's not on the visible spectrum. So, you can't see it, which is why when you're in a sauna, you know, you feel the heat, but you don't see the light or uh, an infrared sauna. But the same thing with us, you know, if we're giving off radiant energy, you're not going to see it, you know, right. but I think that we all know that we've gotten the hairs on the back of our neck that stand up when someone sneaks up behind us and that kind of stuff. You can feel this electromagnetic energy, this radiant energy coming off of people. We definitely put that off. Super interesting. One thing you brought up there that I want to kind of dive into is you mentioned dental health has correlated to potentially negatively impact heart health. Mm -hmm. How is that? I mean, I've actually seen some data, but I'd love to hear exactly what's happening there because that's super interesting and super new. Yeah. Well, I mean, going back to like Chinese medicine, they have like the tooth and the meridian charts, you know, that uh, certain teeth are linked up to certain organs. And if there's a problem with this tooth, then we tend to see problems with that organ. And as far as I know, I haven't looked in a long time, but it's like some of the very back teeth, some of the molars are linked up to the heart. But the way I see it is that there's a lot of dental practices that are harmful to our bodies in general, but I've obviously done a lot of research on the heart and that's my main area of interest. And so, I've looked at it in that aspect. And so, I mentioned before heavy metals being directly linked or, you know, associated with the levels of atherosclerosis we see. And that's heavy metals are something that's being put in people's mouths for a long time now in the form of amalgam fillings and the mercury that's in those. And so, the other part is the endotoxemia that there's a lot of dental practices like root canals or the extraction of teeth and then not cleaning out the periodontal ligament. And that can leave what's called a cavitation in the jaw, which is just kind of an infected pocket in the jaw. And when you remove a tooth or when you do a root canal, you're also taking out the blood supply and the nerve to the tooth. And so now if there's any infection left in there, which no matter what you do with the root canal, there's going to be infection left because of all the small dental tubules, then the body can't get to it. Like it can't get there to fight it off. It can't even tell it's there because the nerve has been severed. And so, what ends up happening is we get this, not like a cyst or anything, but we get like this formation of bacteria, whether it's in the root canal tooth or in the jaw from the pulled tooth, and that's leaking into the bloodstream. 
and the body doesn't really know where it's coming from because it can't sense anything, can't send anything to it. And so it just chronically leaks in there and we get endotoxemia, which is basically just high bacteria in our bloodstream from whatever source, uh, whether it's, you know, we have an infection or because we got sick or whatever, or it's from these teeth or from leaky gut because the gut bacteria can start leaking into the bloodstream. And this endotoxic environment is very, I guess, damaging. It, these things act like those free radicals. They damage the exclusion zone water. And so, I think that, I guess, taking it back and looking at this is what we tend to see with atherosclerosis is we tend to see these things that we see someone with a lot of atherosclerosis also has a lot of these other things. Like we see the heavy metals, we see endotoxemia, we see sometimes high LDL or oxidized LDL or lipoprotein little a, which are all damaged cholesterol molecules. But is it the cholesterol molecules that are causing things or is it the things that are causing damage to the lining of the artery that's also causing this damaged cholesterol? You know, is it this environment that's just damaging everything? And so then the body, once that damages the fourth phase water, damages the glycocalyx, damages the endothelia, then the body tries to repair it. And we end up with these deposits of cholesterol and minerals like calcium and things like that into the artery trying to repair that area. And so then cholesterol was kind of framed. It was caught the scene of the crime and everybody thought that's what it was. Super interesting. Now, so your theory then, and again, you can correct me if this is incorrect, but your theory is that it's not in fact cholesterol. You know, there's a lot of data that says it's not, but it actually is this endotoxemia causing the oxidative stress, which then stresses out the, or effectively deactivates the fourth phase of water, allowing things to maybe negatively impact arterial walls. And the cholesterol is ultimately just going there to potentially help heal what the damage that's been generated from this, these endotoxins. Yeah. I would almost compare it to like spackle. You know, the body sees this damage. It doesn't want it to rupture because if it ruptures, we get a clot formation, which is not a good thing. And so it goes in there and tries to repair this damage. And mm -hmm. when it repairs it, it repairs it with something that's not obviously what it was originally made of. And so that's harder. So now the artery can't do its function very well. It can't expand and contract and, and regulate and blood flow and things like that. One thing I don't know is, and I don't know that Pollock and his lab, I think they're just starting to look at cardiovascular system specifically in more detail, but I don't know if exclusion zone water forms on atherosclerosis. Like is atherosclerosis hydrophilic? I don't know. And if it doesn't, what are the implications of that? Which is a whole other thing that I hope somebody researches one day. Super interesting. So, I mean, that, that's a pretty good theory. I mean, we've, we've all heard for a long time that cholesterol is bad and you need to not eat cholesterol, but it makes a lot of sense because, I mean, obviously cholesterol is naturally occurring in a lot of foods and a lot of people have very high cholesterol and very good heart health. And I don't think there's necessarily a correlation, but that seems to make a lot of sense. Is there actually data behind this or is this kind of just your theory about endotoxemia? It's a theory that I think I've backed up with a lot of data as far as studies that show that, say, various things that can act like free radicals are present when we have atherosclerosis. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Very cool. So, let's say most of us at some point in our life are going to accumulate some type of plaque and some type of arterial and arthrosclerosis. Any thoughts around best practices and, and you know maybe a checklist of things you can go through if people that should people be either eliminating from their life or adding to their life to begin to positively impact their heart health? Yeah. Heart health as far as the, the arteries, definitely. Sure. So yeah. well, it's kind of the things we talked about. I think that one thing we really need to be doing is really being conscious of the toxins that we're exposed to in our life. And you could go crazy trying to avoid them all because they're everywhere. But it's really about being conscious of the things that are toxic that you're being exposed to and controlling the ones that you can. We know everything's toxic, right? Like, is there any yeah. that, that stand out to you as like, hey, be careful with this? Obviously, dental work, you've talked about that. But is there anything else like yeah. you've also mentioned that heavy metals? Yeah. So, heavy metals, it's just some examples of where we might be exposed to heavy metals. Aluminum foil. So, if you're cooking with aluminum foil, that's aluminum is going to end up in your food. You have to be careful about the fish that we eat because they can be, you know, the fish higher on the food chain are going to have more concentrated mercury in them. The dental fillings, like I talked about, but even our tap water, depending on where your tap water is coming from and where you live, can have heavy metals in it. We can talk about there's heavy metals in the deodorant, like antiperspirants. You know, mm -hmm. aluminum is the compound they use to stop sweating from happening. Yeah, I mean, there's cadmium in cigarette smoke. So, even from secondhand smoke, you can be exposed to cadmium. I mean, those are some of the main ones, some of the most common ones. So, there's that. But also just other toxins in general. Like I found a study the other day that showed that a certain plastic compound had been linked to higher levels of atherosclerosis. And so we I mean plastic's pretty pretty toxic which, to which us. Which plastic and, compound was that? 
I don't remember exactly which one it was because now that BPA has been, you know, the most famous one, but now there's other ones like BPS and all this kind of stuff. They just replaced BPA with, which are just as toxic, but now they can say BPA free. So I don't remember exactly which one in that study it was, but it was one of those plasticizers, Mm -hmm. things that make plastic what it is. So if it doesn't matter if it says BPA free, they have to put some type of plasticizer in it to make it plastic, which is just as toxic as BPA. Super interesting. Yeah. So toxins are a big one that I think that people can, you know, look in their environment, learn about those things and eliminate the ones they can and, and don't freak out about the ones you can't because, you know, freaking out about it and stressing out about it is not going to help either. Sure. And I think there's certainly methods you can take or measures you can take to start taking them out of your body. Now, that, that's a whole different ball of wax as well, right? Like if these things are kind of lodged somewhere in your fat or something like that, to start doing excretion of them apparently has tremendous negative implications as well. Yeah, especially if your liver is already backed up. But interestingly, we've already touched on, you know, infrared sauna. There's lots of research that shows that it's very helpful for detoxification, especially the heavy metals. But it makes sense to me, though, because I just talked about how this water forms and it's this exclusion zone water. And so it excludes things that aren't it. And if we, let's say we have toxins that have gotten stored in our tissues, whether it's in the fat or wherever, and we start building this exclusion zone water, well, guess that's going to push anything that's not exclusion zone water away from it and get it out. And so that through the sweating, we actually sweat toxins out. And I think that's one of the mechanisms that it does that by because the exclusion zone water excludes things. That's not it. Very, very interesting. So one thing that you've advocated, and this I'm assuming is very, very related to what we're talking about, but not directly correlated is you've been advocating a carnivore diet. And I'm guessing it's because of the potential heart health benefits and implications. And you know, rather than talking about the benefits of the carnivore diet, I'd actually rather start with looking at why excluded vegetables. Is there something inherently wrong with vegetables that you think is negatively impacting heart health? I think that there are negatives to vegetables and some people are affected more than others. And I'm not saying that it's impossible to achieve a high level of health by eating vegetables or or not to achieve a high level of health. You know, I'm not saying that you have to exclude vegetables to achieve a high level of health, but I think that there's plant toxins. And I think that lots of these plant toxins do act like free radicals in the body, or they can cause like a series of reactions that can lead to free radicals in the body, or they can deplete you of minerals which could ultimately end up with your body not having enough things to neutralize free radicals or things like that. They're not very compatible with physiology. So when I talk about plant toxins, I'm talking about things like lectins or oxalates or phytic acid or tannins, things like that. And so I think that every plant food has a toxin of some sort. And there's a very interesting paper by Bruce Ames way back in the, I think it was the 70s, where the title of the paper is called Plant Toxins or plant pesticides, 99.9% natural, meaning made by the plant, not something pesticides that we sprayed on the plant, you know. And these are defense chemicals for the plant because everything in the environment is just trying to survive and it has ways of defending itself. Humans' main way of defending ourselves is our large brain. We can outthink most other life forms, you know, or have the thought process to keep ourselves away from danger. But other animals, their defense mechanism is that they have claws or teeth or they can run away or they can fight you in some way. But plants can't run away. They don't have big brains. So they've evolved ways to defend themselves, which are plant toxins. And I mentioned what a lot of those are. I mean, there's a lot of research out there that shows that these various plant toxins interfere with the physiology of some animal. And so George Diggs, who's a professor, I think down at Austin College or something like that, his life work has been about these plant toxins and he makes the argument that yes, some of these plant toxins evolved to like say, keep insects off of the plant and defend the plant that way. But since our cellular structure from those insects and humans may be organized into tissues differently, the the cellular structure is somewhat the same and so they affect us the same way. And so obviously we can withstand higher levels of these plant toxins because we're a larger animal, but they still affect us negatively. And so in some cases, I think that a carnivore diet could be a really useful tool as far as helping somebody heal or maintain health. And especially from a cardiovascular standpoint, I think that the best diet for heart health is a ketogenic one, or at least where you're in and out of ketosis. So you're fat adapted or metabolically flexible. And a carnivore diet is definitely that. And I also think that this depletion of plant toxins from eliminating all plants, it's also very useful for decreasing the oxidative stress that contributes to atherosclerosis and heart attacks and all sorts of cardiovascular issues. 
Super interesting. So obviously this carnivore vegan battle is very prevalent right now. And I always like to hear both sides of the fence, right? I always like to hear both sides of the story. And the one that seems to stand out most for carnivores is the fact that it is a toxin and it is they're certainly causing some type of hormetic response and obviously dose dependent response. And if you were to argue the other side and say, hey, this is the reason why people should do vegan, do you have any logical point as to why someone may want to eat less meat? Honestly, I don't. Um, it's not cholesterol. It's not saturated fat. Like there are all these things that people typically go after when it comes to animals. Obviously, there's the argument that's kind of been debunked about its negative implications on the planet. And we know that's nonsense. But as far as just like anything you could see on the other side of the fence, because you know when you formulate a good debate, it typically requires you to go, okay, let's see what their strengths are. And I'm curious, mm -hmm. someone with your level of expertise with respect to cholesterol and with respect to the heart, there would be no reason in your belief, obviously you're following a carnivore diet, so I'm guessing not, but there'd be no reason in your belief to in any way limit the amount of meat products or potentially include vegetables. No, I don't think there's any unique benefit from vegetables. And I don't think there's any reason cardiovascular wise to exclude meat from your diet. I've had some vegan doctors like on social media or everything kind of like comment on stuff and I don't want to get into an argument with them. I tell them, usually I'll, I'll make my points, you know, and it's kind of a little bit of a debate, but it's, I stay very neutral because I appreciate the work that they're doing as well because they're promoting a whole foods diet. And I think that's very, very important. I may disagree with them about which whole foods to include, but obviously I think that the benefits that we see when people go on vegan diets, most of it is because they're going from a standard American diet to a whole foods diet and they'll see obvious benefits short term. I think long term, most people will have some issues. Some people seem to be able to handle that for longer, but we're all a little bit different. And I think that that's one thing I will give them. And I always tell them that, you know, like we may disagree, whoever I'm talking to, but I appreciate that you're promoting the idea that what someone eats is going to have a huge impact on the health because Western medicine does not acknowledge that. And while we may differ in what that is, the optimal thing to eat is like, I do appreciate when people do that. As far as cooking meat, that's one thing that comes up a lot is, is this idea of people overcooking meat and creating the glycation end products. Is that something that you think is a concern? This idea of overcooking, you know, the charring the outside of meats, is that something people should avoid? Yeah, I definitely think that it's an issue, but it's only an issue, I think, because of the amount of toxins that we are exposed to elsewhere in our lives. I think that let's say we were living as a hunter-gatherer way back when and we were cooking meat and we were burning a little bit. It's like, well, that's not a huge deal because that's probably the only toxin we're exposed to that day. And that creates a little bit of a hormetic stress, then that could be a good thing maybe. But if we have countless amounts of toxins all day long that we're exposed to and then we're also charring our meat and getting a lot of heterocyclic amines and poly aromatic hydrocarbons and things like that and forming those advanced cocaine in products like you were talking about, then yeah, that can be a problem. It's just one other contributor to the large amount of toxins that we're exposed to. Very interesting. So to sum it all up, someone wants to live a long time and we want to have a healthy heart. What are some of your best practices? Can you get specific on how you approach your diet, on how you suggest that you know average people approach their diet and what types of things that we should include? Are there any supplements or anything you should include? Like is it you got to make sure you exercise daily? Obviously, we know kind of the general ones. There's nothing that's um, – maybe there's some new ones that we don't know. I just kind of got to want to get an idea of what you think people should be doing to optimize heart health and longevity because this is a massive concern. I mean, there's so many things out there that said, oh, you do this, don't do that. You know, cholesterol medications, don't do cholesterol medications. Take hormones, don't take hormones pesticides, no pesticide. Like there's so many sides to every story. It's ridiculous. I just kind of want to get a, a summary of your best practices that you implement on a day-to-day -day basis that you think are kind of non-negotiables for our listeners. Yeah. So I'll approach it from a dietary standpoint first, and I want to get specific on some nutrients. One of the nutrients is vitamin K2, which is incredibly important for- How much? I don't know exactly. I would just get a lot of K2 from animal sources because that's really the only source of K2 that we're getting. So we're talking about meat in general, but so also organ meats. So would vegans be deficient in K2? I think so, yes, because they only get K1, which is found in like, I mean, kale has a ton, but like leafy vegetables and things like that has a lot of K1, but not a lot of K2. I don't think it has any K2 actually. And so K2 comes from animal sources, like ruminant animals specifically. So whenever they're eating those leafy greens, they're able to turn that leafy green, you know, the grass that they're eating into vitamins and minerals, whereas our digestive system is not so set up to do that. 
But then when we eat them, we get tons of K2. So we're talking about, you know, grass-fed butter, bone marrow, organ meats, grass-fed meats, those types of things. Some of the higher, really high ones are, are cheese is pretty high, but also kefir or kefir, however people say it, those types of things. But the reason it's important is because K2, what it does, one of its roles is that it takes minerals and deposits them where they need to go. And if we don't have K2 and we don't have fat because K2 is a fat soluble vitamin, so that's how it's transported around the body. If we don't have those things, then we can get buildup of minerals where they shouldn't be, say like in our arteries or people who have calcified tendons, ligaments, all kinds of calcified areas in their body. I see that as a widespread K2 deficiency because we're not getting enough K2 in the American diet or the, or the global diet really. Now, um, just so that's one of them. Before you continue on yeah. that. Does it matter if your meat is corn-fed or grass-fed? I think so. I think that there's plenty of examples, especially in the carnivore community, of people who don't pay attention to the quality and they just start eating meat and they see profound benefits in their health. So that's really interesting. But I do think that there's still some toxins in there or maybe the ratio to omega-6 to omega-3 is not as optimal as I'd like. But just eliminating those plant toxins and going into a a state of ketosis seems to do those people very well in not paying attention to that. But I look to optimize. I'm trying to live as long as I can, or at least the highest quality of life that I can. So I pay attention to those things. Plus, I also think that meat raised that way is much better environmentally. And so I, sure. I choose to do that. Yeah. Sorry, I interrupted you. So continuing on on kind of best practices for optimizing heart health. Right. I think the the next thing I just kind of touched on in that answer to your question, I think ketones are very important. I think that the heart is to quote the name of your podcast, a very intelligent muscle. It seems to, I mean, like with the rest of our body, we have to restrict carbohydrates to get into ketosis because your body will burn carbohydrates first. And if they're present, it will choose to burn those. So we have to get rid of them so that your body will be forced to burn fat. And there are clear advantages, I think, to doing that and making ketones. But as far as the heart goes, from all the research I've found, it seems that even in the presence of glucose, the heart will preferentially burn fatty acids and ketones. And there was one study I found that even with glucose present, they put beta-hydroxybutyrate into the heart cells and that glucose production went down or glucose utilization went down 30 to 60% because they had these ketones available to it. So I think ketones are uniquely advantageous to the heart and it prefers to burn those. And you know we can talk about why that is and why I think the heart has this unique ability because I think it protects it from things like heart attack. But yeah, so ketones I think are very important as far as heart health. So, should ketones be something that people kind of cycle in and out of ketosis or should it be, in your belief, kind of be perpetual? Like as often as you can, you're in ketosis and obviously there's certain circumstances, maybe if you're exercising hard, if you're under massive amounts of stress, taking some carbohydrates. But other than that, would your prescription be, hey, stay in ketosis as often as you can? That's what I choose to do. I stay in ketosis pretty much all the time, but I don't think that people have to do that to, again, achieve a high level of health. I'm not like this strict one-way sure. formula, you know, but... I do think that it's very important that people are metabolically flexible, which means that they have the ability to get into ketosis or into fat burning very readily. Right. So the average person eating the standard American diet, their body has no idea how to get into ketosis and start using ketones and fatty acids. It's a glucose-based metabolism because of all the carbohydrates we find in the diet available to us. And so we have to kind of train our body to use ketones for fuel and right. use fatty acids for fuel. And so I think that it's just important. So like, I think that if people do have carbohydrates and they get kicked out of ketosis and they even do that for three days or so, like on vacation, that's not a huge deal. As long as very soon after that, you train your body to get back into ketosis, you go back into carbohydrate restrictions so that you don't lose that flexibility. Sure. So anybody any, ever been in any data? So curious to think about the implications of ketogenic dieting as you, you know, a lot of people who do ketogenic diet are also doing this intermittent fasting thing. And is there ever been anybody who studied like the implications on arteriosclerosis when someone's in a ketogenic state and fasting? Like, is it in some way helping remove those plaques that are there because they're in a ketogenic state and because they're doing this calorie restriction, their body may go tend to be a little bit more likely to kind of remove those plaques because obviously decreasing inflammation, decreasing the toxins, and maybe the cholesterol buildup on the walls would flow through a little bit better? 
That I, I don't know. I don't know that anybody's ever looked at that. I mean, I could speculate as some things. I think that a fat-based metabolism is definitely going to make less free radicals, which is going to give your body a chance to heal those arteries rather than always having to deal with new free radicals coming in. But yeah, I don't know that anybody's looked at the effects of, and I don't know that there's, there may not be a way to study it yet, to look at ketogenic diet and depletion of atherosclerosis or breaking down of atherosclerosis mm -hmm. and forming normal arteries again. I don't, I don't know. Super interesting. Okay. So I interrupt you again, but you're going to finish off with any more best practices. So far we've got K2 and we've got ketones. Yeah. I think that maybe two more. I think that CoQ10 is also very, very important for the heart, especially. How much and what time of the day? How much again, I couldn't tell you. I don't, I'm not huge on supplements. Okay, I, I eat what I feel like my body, you know, what my body needs and have the right foods because those are the quantities that I think our body is designed to get. And so I also think that sometimes synthetic things just aren't really absorbed that much. So you could be taking a certain amount and who knows if that's what you're getting. But yeah, CoQ10 is, is super important because it's what takes fatty acids and brings them into the mitochondria so that you can burn them. Mm -hmm. One of the things that does, or it increases the health of the mitochondria, which are, if they're healthy, we're going to be burning more fatty acids. And so for the heart, you know, one of the most metabolically active organs in our body, even more so than the brain, it's very important that it's the most efficient and CoQ10 is huge for that. And again, we get a lot of that from animal products, from muscle meat and from organ meats and things like that. Yeah, I mean, you can get some from plant products, but it's way more bioavailable. And that's another important thing about animal products is that we absorb way more of what we're eating than those products. So there's that one. And then there's cholesterol in general. I think that cholesterol is very, very heart healthy. And if we look at a lot of studies that look at statins and things like that and limiting the amount of cholesterol that your body is getting or PCSK9 inhibitors, things like that. So cholesterol is like this big to make cholesterol for your body to take a fatty acid and make cholesterol from it. There's like this 20 step process and a statin will inhibit that process at the beginning or near the beginning, maybe two or three steps in. And then there's all these intermediate steps that happen to get it to cholesterol, but your body just doesn't go and make cholesterol. Sometimes it takes those intermediate molecules that are made to use it for other things. Like for example, there's one that's used as part of the structure of a insulin receptor. And so if we're depleting cholesterol, we're depleting that intermediate and now we get dysfunctional insulin receptors and that could potentially lead to type 2 diabetes. There's lots of studies that show that people who take statins have increased rates of type 2 diabetes. Now, am I incorrect in assuming that I've heard some negative data on plant cholesterol, like plant sterols? I remember, I think, hearing something that, you know, you're almost wanting to avoid these things or because I've heard data in the past that says plant sterols are very, very healthy. You should optimize and increase your consumption. And then I think I've recently heard, I don't know if you're familiar with that data, that said plant sterols may actually have negative implications. Any feedback? Yeah. So, I think this will be my next blog I'm coming out with. But also Nadir Ali posted a video recently about it and it's very interesting because so I think of it this way, plant sterols, plant cholesterol, plants form of cholesterol is what they have for them. You know, it's what helps them build the structure of the plant bodies and things and animals like us have cholesterol and that's our molecule that helps us. That's our fatty substance that helps us build our structure and do functions for mammals. And so, if we start absorbing a lot of these plant sterols and they get involved in this process, it's just not going to do as good of a job. And so, one of the really interesting things is that whenever red blood cells start to be made up more of plant sterols, they lose their flexibility. They start to become more rigid and they need to be flexible because when they get down to the capillaries where they have to kind of squeeze through and they're kind of like lined up in single file going through these capillaries, they need to be flexible. And so, when they're not, that can, that can cause issues because now it can't get through and that can cause blockages and things like that or it can and rupture things and cause bleeding. And, and that's exactly what we see. There's this one study and it was in rats and it was in these rats that were, they were trying to study strokes. So, they kind of made these rats, I guess, genetically susceptible to strokes just so they could actually test it without having to do as extreme of things, you know. And they fed these three groups of rats. One, they fed corn oil one they fed olive oil and one they fed animal fat. I don't remember specifically what type of animal fat it was or which animal it came from. But the rats who were fed animal products lived 150 days longer on average than the other two as far as the strokes or reducing a stroke. So, 
it's just very interesting. So I just want to hear your opinion on saturated fat. So as we wrap up, I think the biggest thing that I hear against carnivore diet is like, hey, it's cholesterol is a big problem. I have too much cholesterol. And this is obviously a 1980 mentality and saturated fat. And people think saturated fat is going to be negative as well. And I just want to hear your perspective on people who say, hey, I don't want to have a carnivore diet. I don't want to eat too much meat because of the saturated fat. I guess I'll start off by saying that I don't think we should blame fats for what the processed carbohydrates have done. And I think that that's the problem is that a lot of these studies that are showing that saturated fat is bad are first of all, epidemiology, which we cannot draw conclusions from because it's, it can only show association and not causation. We should use those studies to design clinical trials based on the, the associations we see, but unfortunately, recommendations are made. And then also, a lot of the studies are done where these subjects or animal models or whatever it may be are eating a lot of saturated fat, but it's also coming with a bunch of sugar, which is a lot of the way that processed foods come from. Yeah, they're just eating the two combined. And so, I think that not only will the sugar have, you know, sugar or processed grains or whatever have a negative impact on our health by themselves, but they will also cause damaged fats because these foods are very inflammatory to our bodies and that can damage fats. Just like the oxidative stress that damages the, the fourth phase water and the lining of the artery, you know, they're also going to damage the cholesterol that's in there or the fatty acids are in there. And so then we see this oxidized cholesterol and we see these inflammatory molecules like lipoprotein little A or things like that. And we start to blame cholesterol when really it's not the cholesterol's fault. It's not the saturated fat that we're eating. It's all the sugar we're eating with it because I don't know of, of anybody who's you know not paying attention to health and eating the standard American diet that's just eating sugar. They're always eating saturated fat with it because lots of those products are made like a Twinkie, you know, for instance, tons of saturated fat and also tons of sugar. And so until we find a way to separate out the two, which I think we really have because we have this growing number of people following a carnivore diet where there's absolutely no sugar right. and there's tons of saturated fat experiencing very high levels of health, even if their blood work looks a little funny, according to Western medical standards, we can't deny the fact that they've had extreme health turnarounds. Well, and I love that you said that conventional Western medical standards may not be accurate, right? Everything over the last hundred years has been completely manipulated to fit into industry. And, you know, even insulin, resting insulin levels have clearly been doctored to be higher than they should be. All these things are, it's just a life of manipulation based on industry. And I'm so glad that you're, the, well, that this whole movement is happening and you're a big part of it is kind of substantiating, challenging the conventional paradigm, challenging what we think is accurate, right? Like we've been taught over the last hundred years or say 50 years probably that eating grains and corn and wheat are healthy for you because it's obviously easiest to produce. And that's become a multi-billion, maybe multi-trillion dollar industry that has to be perpetuated to ultimately drive industry and drive jobs and drive the economy to exist. If people tried to just eat meat, it would you know, ultimately revert back to farming practice, which may not be a sustainable practice to maintain the constant turnover of business, right? We can't have people going back to farming and we need them working in jobs. So I get it. So, and I love that we're challenging this and this is so useful. The one thing I want to kind of finish with Dr. Hussey is, is there anything else that kind of pops into mind if people are just li looking to live their greatest life? And we didn't talk about, you know, their implications of, you know, heart rate variability and sympathetic nervous system and things like that. But is there anything else that jumps out at you that's like, hey, if you really want to live your greatest life and, and optimize health long-term and short-term, is there anything else that jumps out that you say, hey, everybody should be doing? this on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. So if people will go to my blog, they'll see that I talk a lot about the three imbalances. And these are three imbalances that I think drive heart attacks. But I think that those are not being metabolically flexible. It's increased oxidative stress, which we talked a lot about. Of, and then you just touched on the third one, I think is maintaining autonomic nervous system balance. And so I think that in today's world, we are bombarded with a lot of unnatural stressors. And those stressors are they're hard on our currently evolved physiology because we evolved in nature and it hasn't been that long that we've been in civilization. And so I think there's a lot of stressors, unnatural stressors that really drive an imbalance in our stress response. And when that happens, your body doesn't know how to respond anymore. And so that can lead to a lot of issues. And I think it's ultimately what triggers heart attacks. So those three things, I think that if people focus on those things and then, you know, there's lots of nuance and and how to achieve the health of those three things. We talked a lot about the the first two, but as far as like health of the autonomic nervous system, that's like increased community, increased contact with nature, 
things like meditation yeah. and yoga. I talk about that a lot on here, and that's kind of something yeah. I dive into almost every podcast because I, I believe it's it's maybe the most important thing that people. It's just sitting right there in front of you, right? It's not complex. It doesn't cost any money, and it's it's life optimization, brain optimization, body composition optimization strategies all wrapped into these really simple practices that just. They're easy. They're, so they, that's the irony of life, right? Is they're easy not to do, but they're also easy not to do. And it's definitely something we advocate a lot. Exactly. Yeah. And I do think that once you make it a priority, it is pretty easy. Mm-hmm. Dr. Hussey, thank you so much for your time, your wisdom, and your continued effort to make this world a better place and educate us with this amazing information. Where can our listeners find more from you? Yeah, my website is resourceyourhealth.com. And on there, I have my, that's where people can find me for health coaching. My books are on there. My blog is on there. And then I'm also pretty active on social media, posting mainly about the heart on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. And it's just Dr. Stephen Hussey, Dr. Stephen Hussey. People can find me there. Amazing. Thank you so much for your time. We truly appreciate you and have a great day. I really appreciate you having me on. So thanks. All right, ladies and gents, that's a wrap. Hopefully you enjoyed this conversation going deep into heart health. I'm your host, Ben Bukulski. I love that you guys are here. I love that we're on this mission together to optimize life, body, and mind. Truly, thank you. Thank you all for being such amazing listeners and such amazing contributors to this mission because I know you guys are all spreading the message every day on social media and uh, with your family and friends. And that's really what this is about. It's not just, this is not about me. It's not even about you. This is about everyone. This is about sharing this message with people that we know and love so that we can ultimately live our greatest life with people around us that are healthy and happy and stress-free and bringing bliss into our lives together. Have an amazing day. And if you guys haven't already checked out Blue Box, go do that now, bluebox.com slash muscle intelligence, E-L-U-B-L-O-X.com, 15% off. Use the code muscle intelligence. Live your greatest life in a body that you absolutely love. Thank you so much for tuning into Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Bikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.